Well, it won't be lost on anyone that the UK economy is currently facing an almost unprecedented number of major challenges. These include the after effects of the COVID pandemic, the fallout from Brexit, and the consequences of the ongoing war in Ukraine, such as the energy crisis, which has both significant implications for the level of costs faced by UK businesses, as well as contributing to an increase in living costs for many UK households. That in turn means a marked reduction in the amount of discretionary spending finding its way into the UK economy across a wide range of sectors. For anyone with an interest in real estate, whether as a commercial landlord, commercial tenant, property investor, or even as a homeowner, the impact of the various factors that I have just mentioned is becoming all too tangible, and therefore gives rise to the question of the likelihood of there being a worryingly significant increase in the coming months in the numbers of formal insolvencies where property is a key element, as the country looks to be falling into the grip of an inevitable and probably overdue recession. Well, the major port of call in trying to determine the direction of travel of property-related insolvency is arguably to view it from a sector-specific perspective. So let's start then with hospitality and leisure. Well, the hospitality industry has regularly hit the headlines recently, with increased numbers of businesses having to close due to rising and unaffordable energy bills. The extent of the rise in business failure, notwithstanding government promises to provide some much-needed support over the coming months, means that more businesses are now facing the threat of insolvency as a result. The insolvency service has reported a massive 59% increase in corporate insolvencies in the industry over the past 12 months, mostly taking the form of creditors' voluntary liquidations, which means that company directors are now increasingly taking active steps to close the doors ahead of creditors pursuing action against them for unpaid liabilities. From the point of view of businesses that rely on healthy levels of discretionary spend, and as the cost of living crisis worsens, the number of insolvencies is likely to increase further. There was a 37% increase in corporate insolvencies from July to August this year alone, and it has been suggested that no less than three out of every four nighttime economy-related businesses, such as bars and clubs, are currently nearing insolvency. In fact, over 150 licensed premises are closing every single week, meaning that there are now almost 10% fewer licensed premises in the UK than was the case at the start of the pandemic back in March 2020. Well, a growing number of hotels, many of which have restaurants attached to them, have also faced the threat of insolvency. One example is a well-known hotel in the northeast of England, the Sea Hotel in South Shields, which recently went up for sale at 1.65 million after its owners, a property development group, went into administration last year. The business was reported to have £2 million worth of debt, and in fact the hotel had been incurring losses for the past couple of years, despite the owner's best efforts to restructure the business to capitalise on more profitable seasonal trading, such as over the summer months and at Christmas, although of course the Covid restrictions of 2020 and 2021 won't have helped with its occupancy levels. With the ability of hospitality and leisure sector businesses to revise their business models to help ensure their survival will be critical over the coming months, whatever the level of support expected from the government, which announced that it would provide ongoing and targeted support to the most vulnerable businesses in the sector. As ever, cash is king. All businesses with exposure to property-related costs, and small businesses in particular, must keep a close eye on their cash flow and make forecasts for the coming months to give themselves the best chance of surviving the tough times ahead. In particular, they should keep in regular contact with their creditors and try to agree on a way forward that both sides are happy with to avoid the risk of insolvency, such as agreeing new payment terms if the business is likely to default on payments, restructuring existing loans, or indeed renegotiating lease terms with landlords. Well, considering that last point then, the behaviour of commercial landlords is going to be key and hospitality and leisure is not the only sector where the position of landlords will be carefully watched in the coming months. Well, another sector that's continued to struggle, facing the impact of the fallout from COVID, and particularly reduced footfall, as well as the rising cost of energy, such as for lighting and heating, is the retail sector, with the Office for National Statistics producing research showing that there were 802 retail industries insolvencies covering both wholesale and retail 
in the second quarter of 2022, a rate unseen since the tough times of 2012. More worryingly, that constitutes a 122% increase year on year since the same period in 2021. One of the biggest issues affecting retailers, given the changing habits of consumers, the impact of the COVID pandemic and the potentially irreversible trend towards online shopping, which has massively impacted footfall post-pandemic, is the way in which retail businesses with leased property portfolios are having to turn to formal insolvency procedures to address their significant rent liabilities, which are increasingly becoming unsustainable. Most recently, indeed within the past month or so, Businesses such as Jules, the fashion retailer, with a 130-store portfolio in the UK and Ireland, and Wilco, the uh, homesware store business, which has already closed 15 outlets, are now looking towards the company voluntary arrangement, a formal insolvency process which, where successful, will cap the level of liabilities that, co that a company has to pay to its creditors, including its landlord creditors. One of the more controversial aspects of the CVA so far as companies with exposure to a significant leased property portfolio are concerned, is its ability to force commercial landlords to compromise the level of rent arrears they can recover, and worse still, going forwards, to accept reduced levels of ongoing rent, where the terms of the CVA provide for a reduction or downwards restructuring of a company's rent obligations for commercial premises, and the terms of the CVA are voted through by a large enough proportion of creditors controlling at least 75% of the vote by reference to the overall liabilities of the company. Well, the British Property Federation, which represents the views of commercial landlords, has been extremely vocal in its criticism of CVAs, and re retail CVAs in particular, pointing out that almost half of CVAs that they looked at appear to impact property owners in particular, which was getting on for double the number of cases that affected trade creditors. As well as looking at ways in which CVA proposals to creditors could be improved, such as with better standardisation of the format of the proposals so that landlord creditors can more easily see what's being proposed, it's been suggested that company directors should be required to consult with the BPF on behalf of affected property owners who are members of the organisation. Let's face it, the real problem here, though, is that of the potentially damaging effects of CVAs upon landlord creditors, including the enforced write-off of arrears, reduction of future rent income, compromising claims for dilapidations, the premature termination of leases where it may be difficult to find a replacement tenant, creating a link between the rent able to be charged by the landlord and the turnover of the tenant, and even the potential rewriting of lease terms. The question is whether all of the changes that some CVA proposals seek to impose upon landlord creditors are actually required for the purposes of enabling a retail business to restructure its debt burden in order to be able to trade out of its difficulties or rather provide an opportunity to manipulate the level of costs for that business unfairly at the expense of its landlords. The key factor here is of course that of voting power and the voting mechanism within the CVA that allows for the entire body of creditors to have their say on whether the CVA is passed and is binding on all creditors. If 75% of the creditors by value vote in favour of the CVA, it is then binding on all creditors, even if most or all landlord creditors, who may be severely impacted by its implementation, vote against the proposals. The potential impact of this scenario was referenced by the judge in a recent case, the 2021 case of Lazari Properties 2 Limited versus New Look Retailers Limited, where it was commented that New Look's senior secured note holders were able to carry a CVA vote through, even though they were entirely unaffected by the CVA itself. The court pointed out the obvious imbalance in terms of fairness to the outcome for landlords, where the terms imposed on them were unduly onerous. So what then is the solution to all of this? Well, perhaps it's nothing short than a wholesale change in the way that CVAs are actually voted upon, where the landlord class of creditors maybe would need to vote to pass the CVA in a, in a majority vote before it is then imposed on all creditors. I think that's one for the legislators perhaps to work on going forwards. Well, before moving on to consider other insolvency processes, a passing word on the perceived impact of COVID-19 and the move to flexible working on the rented office accommodation sector. 
You might think that there could be some welcome news for embattled businesses facing high levels of business rates and previous steep rises in principal rent, but there doesn't seem to be any perceptible change or drop in passing rent rates to look forward to. If anything, there looks to be a move by office landlords towards exiting the market, with residential property developers keen to snap up opportunities to build more and more apartments, driven by a huge demand for city centre living, as opposed to working in city centre offices. So, with the prospect of no increase in the supply of grade A office accommodation going forwards, the hopeful reduction in rent looked unlikely to materialise. One trend that we are starting to see as a result of increased hardship in the UK economy is a rise in LPA or fixed charge receiverships, where lenders who secure loan liabilities over a borrower's property then take steps to realise that property when the borrower can no longer service the loan, thus providing the lender with an opportunity to enforce their fixed charge security over the borrower's property and then sell it to obtain repayment of the balance of the loan, plus potentially high levels of interest and other additional charges following the termination of the loan. Whilst the sale by receivers of a property, whether it be a commercial property or a residential property, can provide an opportunity to snap up a bargain in the open market, and although receivers do have a duty to obtain the best price reasonably available when selling, inevitably there will be a potential loss of equity value should there be a surplus left available to a borrower once the lender has recovered the loan and other repayments, contributing to a hit on the borrower's balance sheet and, all too often, depending upon the significance of the property to the business, a complete cessation of trade and a formal insolvency process, often liquidation. Well, finishing off our brief review of the UK's business landscape and the impact of formal insolvency upon property-related companies, A glance forward to the months ahead wouldn't be complete without considering the trend for company administrations, often seen as a non-terminal process where the prospect of restructuring a business and preserving a property footprint, where the business model still supports it, lends itself towards the greatest chance of salvaging a future for the business, its employees and its customers. There are definite signs of some upwards movement in the numbers of administrations across many sectors in the UK economy, not least the construction sector. That said, it may only be the next few months, with companies being hit extremely hard by the factors that I mentioned at the start of my talk, that reveal whether we are indeed in for a flurry of administrations driven by the opportunity to preserve businesses and jobs, rather than purely by the ability ability to make payments to some of the companies secured and preferential creditors. One positive aspect of the process now which wasn't the case before the change in the law surrounding payment of rent and administrations during the last decade, is that companies whose administrators continue to use commercial premises for the benefit of the administration have to pay rent to the property's landlord as an expense of the administration so long as the property continues to be used. This at least compensates for the fact that the statutory moratorium in administration prevents a landlord from exercising rights of forfeiture without going to court or obtaining the consent of the administrator. There's no ability to disclaim an onerous lease in administration as opposed to a liquidation, and so the need to maintain a dialogue with the landlord means that there are prospects of a better outcome for all parties concerned, including the landlord. A better outcome includes the opportunity of an agreed surrender to allow the landlord to bring in a new tenant if there is one waiting, or even the prospect of securing a replacement tenant in the form of a buyer of the business, where they can provide a decent enough tenant covenant, uh, with the landlord often able to secure the recovery of pre-insolvency arrears of rent as part of the deal with the new tenant. Whilst it will be difficult to predict exactly where the UK economy is likely to be in, say, a couple of years' time, one thing is certain, which is that there will be a continuing increase in formal insolvencies and especially those where real estate is a key part of a company's asset base and business model.